sure what Jesus has to tell us today. I'm not sure what that is, but we'll find out. Last night was so much fun for everybody that was here. We had some, the guys' night, the guys' shindig was so fun. The movie was awesome. The haircuts were great. I mean, we just had so much fun. So for those of you that missed it, we'll have another one next year. Yeah. Yep. It was, it really was just so much fun. The food was off the chain. And so um, it was uh, a really good time. I loved every minute of it. And we had a full house and it was just, again, just, I can't, I mean, you know, it's funny because when we first started two and a half years ago, um, Thanksgiving, we came downtown because none of us in our church, we had become, um, the building we were in where we had our men's halfway house, they wanted to sell it, we didn't want to buy it. So we became a church without a building and nobody had anything to do on Thanksgiving. And so what we decided we would do is we would just make a bunch of sack lunches and some goodie bags and we came downtown. And we, at the time, folks were still sleeping around the courthouse and the jail. And so, um, I, and I, over the years, had done, I used to lead a singles group and we used to go down to Unity Park a lot. And, and I had done some stuff on Lancaster, but I, God didn't tell us to go to Lancaster. God told us to come over here. And so we came over here and um, met lots of really cool folks. And I was talking to a gentleman and he asked, he said, where's your church? Because I could listen to you. And I said, we're actually a homeless church. And the Holy Spirit said, and now you're going to minister to the homeless community. And I'm telling you, we have not regretted one moment of two and a half years. Um, I see how God prepared us as a church leading up to this point. But I am here to tell you that United Bible Community is here to serve the homeless. That is who God has called us to. I can't see him ever changing it because it is such a good fit. Um, you know, he called us originally when we started our church in 2010, he called us to minister to the recovering community because all of our folks had recovered or recovering from something. So been there, done that, it's really easy to minister to folks in that same avenue. And then a couple of years later, he called us to start a men's halfway house. And it just happened to be that several of our folks had TDC numbers. So that worked out, enabling us to minister in that avenue. And then when God called us here, many of our folks, including my husband and I, have spent some time without a roof. And so um, just really equipped us to share the God's word, share God's word, share his love in a way that connects. Because I don't know about y'all, but I'm not comfortable going into a room full of people in suits. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with people that wear suits, because there is not. But that's not me. Um, I'm not, I'm just, I, I don't relate, I don't connect. And so, in order to relate and connect, it helps when it's someone that's been there, done that, that's walked the same path, that's traveled the same journey, that has had the same kind of story, because there's a relationship there of understanding. There's an opportunity that, that gives birth to, I can pick up what you're laying down because I know you've been here. I would have a hard time with someone trying to tell me how to get clean that's never used drugs before. Amen. You know, it's, they, could, they can't understand at all what it is to put down whatever that addiction is to surrender and struggle with the control that that addiction has over you to struggle with kicking it to struggle with jonesing and to struggle with now what do i do with my time with my hands with all my spare money um, <laughs> etc so i know why god's called us here and i am so humbled and so grateful that he has taken us down this path into this place. And you know
you know, I've, I've talked many a time about my testimony and the short version of like how our church began. Um, it'd be real hard to hear me. It would be real hard for you to understand having a relationship with Jesus if someone that's trying to teach it to you has never walked away from Jesus or lived for self all their life until they came to Jesus. Do y'all know what I mean? Does that make sense? So because I was the prodigal child for 14 years or more, um, I understand the journey of coming back or even the journey of coming to the Lord for the first time at an older or more advanced stage in life because you got to understand that with every stage in life there's a history that comes along with it right and all that history when we've lived for self when we walked um, without the Lord what it does is creates baggage and and so we carry a suitcase with us an invisible suitcase not the kind that we do carry but the invisible kind a suitcase of broken relationships we carry a suitcase of, of um, times of disappointment and hurt when people have let us down when people have abandoned us we carry a suitcase of struggles of addiction and and trying to make it when you just can't anybody understand that one when it just seems like the harder you try the farther behind you get and the worse it goes. And then we carry um, a suitcase full of, 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 of the baggage of rejection and abandonment and ridicule. And, okay, I mean, I could go on and on and on. And I carried for a long time all these bags with me that I didn't even realize I carried. And what it did was it caused me it affected my life in a paramount way, not in a good way. So when I carried, um, okay, I was adopted at birth and by some parents that couldn't have children and I loved my parents. We are in a great relationship now, my mom and I. My father's already with my, uh, my heavenly father. But my mom had this problem that because she couldn't have children, she very much resented me because I wasn't the little girl or the, the daughter that she wanted to have and I certainly didn't meet the mold that she thought daughters should be. Quiet, very quiet, and, and, and well-mannered and not loud and boisterous and not animated and certainly not with pink hair. I'm telling you, they almost lost their teeth the first tattoo I got. I mean, it was just like, I was not the idea of that. So I had this self-talk back in my mind that not only did my biological mother not want me, but my adopted mom didn't want me either. And, and so growing up with I didn't realize I was going to carry 
and then getting pregnant out of wedlock as a senior in high school really just put the icing on the cake and um, really made for many, many, many years of bad choices. I look for answers in the bottom of a black label Jack Daniels. I look for answers in, in many addictions that I thought would, if nothing else, cover up the pain for a little while because it just wasn't right. You know how you get feeling like when you feel as if something's just not lining up right? This, there's got to be more. There's got to be something different than what I have because what I have just isn't holding a whole lot of value for life. Y'all with me? So, in a very tragic season in life, with my oldest daughter at this time, probably about 13, so they would have been 13, 10, and 6, and um, at this point, four failed marriages. I, I said, okay, I see a common denominator, okay? When any of my ex-husbands, the only common denominator in all of this was me. And with my oldest daughter who had come to the Lord and been going to church with some friends and had come to the Lord as a brand new baby in Christ and went away for six weeks to a self-esteem weight loss camp and came back, left a brand new baby in Christ and came back addicted to heroin and in the cult. And um, I didn't think I was going to make it. But I couldn't check out, which was really on the top of my list as options, because I had two other younger children, because I really had written her off at this point. Um, side note commercial, okay? When you get in a place in life and you think life is gonna be this way for the rest of my life, I'm here to tell you the sun comes up tomorrow. So don't ever think that this is the end of the road and think, because I really thought, she will be like this forever. She wouldn't even call me mother. She would only call me Mary because she worshiped the Mother Earth and whatever. I said, if you call me mom, I ain't feeding you. And we did that for a while. We did that for a couple of days. I had to turn off my phone and stop my mail. And I mean, it was a rough season. And again, at the top of the list was, I'm gonna run because I was good at running. I was really good at putting on my shoes and hitting the road and trying to get away from this so I could start that in hopes that that would be better. So running was at the top of the list, but I, like I said, I had two younger children that somebody still needed to raise because I thought Natalie was a goner. Um, so it occurred to me that I could, instead of running away, I could run to the one who had the answers. Instead of running away and things staying the same because I still had all that baggage. I still had everything that had made my life what it was. Instead of running away, my eyes were opened and I decided I could run too. Back to Jesus. Back into the arms of my Savior. Back to the one who had the answers back to my father who had a design for my life that was not what I was living. So in running to him and beginning a relationship with him, not religion. Religion kills. Religion is all about rules. Religion is restrictive. Religion dominates. Religion destroys. Religion is not what a relationship with Jesus Christ is about. And so in, in running to, beginning a relationship, I got to get rid of all my baggage. I got to get rid of all of my bad self-talk and bad living for self and begin to develop a life that's free. Scripture says, and the sun sets free is free indeed. That's it's right. the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's that changing, the word repentance doesn't mean anything other than turning around and doing it different. That's it. Turn around and do it different.
different. If what you're doing isn't working, do something different. And I began to recognize, the more I read this, the more the relationship began to grow, that not only was there hope, but there was a light at the end of the tunnel and it wasn't a train coming at me. <laughs> that there were answers that I could take and apply to my life and now live the abundant life that Jesus Christ died for me to have. See, we've been taught, most of us have been taught, I know I was taught um, growing up in religion in church, that Jesus died on the cross because I was a sinner and if he didn't die on the cross for my sins, I was doomed. And while there is truth to that, because there is truth to that, that's not why he died on the cross. He died on the cross to give back to me my original identity so that I could give up what wasn't mine anyways. It's not my identity to live in addictions. It's not my identity to live in strife and chaos and struggles. That's not my identity, but that was the life I was living with all the baggage that I was carrying. So when Jesus died on the cross, he came to save that which was lost. In the Garden of Eden, when God scooped up dirt and he made man and he breathed life into him and he said, I will create, we will create man in our image, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then we're created in the image that looks like him. But how many of us, for a long time, I didn't look into the mirror and see Jesus Christ. Look into the mirror and see love. Because Jesus didn't do all the things that he did because he's God's son. He did all the things that he did because he's love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is giving. Love is self-sacrificing. Love puts others first. Love forgives. There's a whole list of things that love is. And Jesus was the human version of what that looks like. And the reason he is, is because we learn in scripture that God is love. Not God loves, God is love. So when we are loving, we are copying, mimicking the Father. And when I came back to Jesus, when I came back to my relationship with the Father, I came running back into his arms, I began to develop these things and change these things about myself through the agent of the Holy Spirit, through the acting of the Holy Spirit, through the chiseling away of the things that I had brought into my life and covered myself with. Like the ugly duckling, we need to look at our reflection. Yes. Anybody ever stepped in dog doo-doo in your life? Yeah. Man, yes. what is that smell? Yes. And, and you look around and you even, maybe even check the bottom of your shoes and it's like, still smell it because it gets in the little cracks and crevices of your shoe and unless you wash those shoes with water or stomp in a mud puddle or something your shoes still gonna smell like dog do you know what I'm saying so what happens is we live life and step in dog do because that's this world when Satan was expelled from heaven when the war in heaven happened and Satan and his minions were expelled, he came here. Actually, he came to the darkness out of heaven. And then when God created the earth and stuff and it became unvoid, then this is his domain. So it's his world, it's his game, it's his rule, and he's always out to get us. John 10, 10, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's the thief that comes that lays out the doo-doo traps for you to step in. And then you step in them because it just happens because we're in his territory. And unless you recognize that you've got dew on your foot and you need to wash your shoe and get the dew out of the cracks of your shoe, you're gonna walk around smelling like dog doo-doo. <laughs> I'd smelled like dog doo-doo for years because I didn't know it. I didn't understand that when I was taught by the world and adapted myself to living in the world and surviving my addictions and covering up my pain and and, and living for self and man, I just, you just got no idea what I used to be like. I mean, you got no idea what I used to be like. <laughs> you may have an imagine, you can maybe imagine it, but I am telling you. I know you were definitely rocking shit on rails. Yes. I 
watched Thursday. I watched my middle daughter. My mom was a yeller. Did anybody raise me as a yeller? My mom was a yeller, and I turned around and I was a yeller. And then I taught my children, my daughters, to be yellers. And so, in very stressful times on Thursday, when the car wasn't fixed, and Purse Lane hadn't done her chores, and, and the kids were on the electronics before their homework was done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and she yelled at them. And I was like, ooh, because I could see and remember what I used to look like. My heart broke for her and for my grandkids because what we do, we only do what we know. And so we teach what we know. And so we teach and then it repeats itself. Until somebody stops the cycle and makes a difference. Um, oh, that was a commercial. I'm not sure well, that was all, that was all Jesus. I don't know what he was telling us. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that you can live life not like you're living it now because there is freedom and you know scripture says in Galatians that the fruit of the spirit the fruit of the spirit is this okay when the Holy Spirit comes to live in me when Jesus becomes my Savior and I surrender my life to him there is love I mean you could just ponder that for a moment how many days go by that you don't experience or feel or give out love? I'm talking about real love, not the adulterated version that the world has. I'm talking about real love. That it keeps no record of wrong and is not offended by people. Love. The God of, the God of all things created everything God loved. That kind of love. That love is everything. And then joy. How many days go by where you have and don't experience joy? I mean real joy. I'm not talking about happiness. That's circumstantial and happens and things are okay. I'm talking about joy that no matter what happens, everything's coming up from you. So love and then joy and then what about peace? How many of us go days without having peace? No matter what happens, no matter when the code shows up and says you got 48 hours to leave, there's still peace. I thought I'd be the first to know. <laughs> yeah. So, the things of this world hold nothing of any value, of any eternal consequence, of any, nothing in that love, joy, peace category, nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing this world has to offer that's of any value. There's a lot of adulterated versions of what God has. For everything God has, Satan has a copy of. God has love, Satan has lust. 
God has a euphoric high in, in being in a relationship with him and this world has drugs. God heals pain, the world covers pain. So there's always a, a copy of that. So of all of these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, it's all in Galatians. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's a package deal. When we die to self, we're born again, and that becomes who I am. That's my new identity. All that comes and is in me and is me. It now is who I am. And with those things operating in me, I'm telling you, it makes life different. It makes life real different. You know, there's a... Um, in Luke... We're going to go here today. Luke, um, something. Or can I say something on that note? Absolutely. You know, everybody is probably familiar with AA and NA and how to say it. it works if you're working. But when you get ready to surrender your life to God and live for Jesus, He's just waiting on you to surrender all of your trash to Him. Not part of it, not the part that you don't think you can handle, not the part that's not working out for you, but all of it. Right. <laughs> You can trade all your trash for his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, and I promise you your life will never be the same. Right. But until you give it all to him, you're not going to get everything she's talking about. Right. Yeah, but I'm, yeah. I'm, li I'm, I'm living proof. Because like she is. Darren, Steve, Greg, there's a bunch of them too. We've been where you're at. But until you will give him all of it and let him do <coughs> what he wants to do with your life, you're not gonna you're not gonna really know that. The reality of what she's talking about yep. until you get to that point. But once you do, I promise you, it'll never come back. It'll never be the same. Amen, brother. Yeah, Amen. Amen. And you know, it's like I was talking about a minute ago with the dog you stepped in dog doo doo, and you can wipe it off, you can rub your foot on the dirt, you know, and think you got it all, but you can still smell it because it's in the crevices of your shoe. That's like turning part of it over. That's like giving in the stuff you don't want to handle, the part that is too big for you, and you're just going to keep this part over here to yourself and you're gonna you can handle this part well he don't want you to handle this by the way let me throw this in here nowhere 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 in the bible does it say that god will not give you more than you can handle <laughs> did you hear me the bible does not say that god will not give you more than you can handle it is a lie from the pit of hell now he says that he will not that he will not cause you to be tempted more than he will provide you a way out but it doesn't say so when crap happens in your life and you go man that preacher told me that god wouldn't give me any more than i could handle and now look what's happening either there's not a god or that god was lying or you know fill in the blank so he wants you the reason that there's more to handle than you can handle is because you need god there is in your heart a throne that is the Lord of your life and if it's only a one seater and so either you will sit on it and you will live for self or God will sit on it and he will be the Lord of your life and take care of the things you know I was talking to Mendigo that Jesus yes he died on the cross because I'm a sinner but he died on the cross to restore to me and give back to me what was stolen from me in Genesis 3 in the garden I think I got sidetracked which happened for all of you folks that have been around, y'all know that happens all the time. Created perfect in God's image, in His image, looking like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then that was stolen from us, okay? He said, if you eat of this tree, you will die. What will die is our identity and our original created value. So when my original created value died, and I'm no longer who God made me to be, then I needed some way to get that back. Anybody ever had something taken from them and you know who has it and you want it back? Everybody says me. When I realized that my created value, identity, and worth, and all of that had been taken from me, and I know who took it. The world took it. The enemy took it. Just by nature, we're born into sin by the fall of Adam and by nature and by generational curses and just the way of this world and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't who I'm supposed to be. So I know 
people who stole it from me, I know how to get it back. I go back to my creator. You know, if you're going to return something and get it fixed, you return it to the original manufacturer and they either fix it or send you a brand new one. The original manufacturer, I go to him and he says, oh baby, that's not who you're supposed to be. You are supposed to look like this. You're supposed to be this, feel this, have this, etc., etc." And so when Jesus died on the cross, he gave me the opportunity to have that back. But in like Tony was talking about, in order to have that, I got to kill this. It says that we are to die to self. You know, scripture does not say. Okay, Jesus said, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, and the new has come. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you got to follow me daily. You pick up your cross, you die to self, and follow me. It does not say that you pick up your cross and deny Satan and follow me. Satan's not our worst enemy. We are our own worst enemy. When you've been born again, when you are a, a child of God, the only power Satan holds, has over us is the power we give him. Because according to scripture, dude is dead. He is a cut off, withering branch. His time, he's already been sentenced. Anybody ever been in court? Okay, so you go to court, you've got a charge against you, the judge makes a ruling, he slams the gavel down, and then the sentence has to be carried out. When Jesus died on the cross. Satan thought he'd won. He was like, oh yeah. And there was a huge party because he thought he had won. The problem is three days later, Jesus came back. And when Jesus came back, he conquered sin and death. And now death no longer has control or power over those of us that are in Christ. And so when he came back and he made everything new, at that moment, Satan had been judged. He'd been judged. He's now a cut off withering branch, and all that he's waiting for is the second return of Christ. And at that point, the nail will be nailed in the coffin. Ish. It's going to happen. It will begin with that. And Satan will have an eternity in hell. Now, commercial. Hell, we call it hell. Sheol is what the Bible calls it. Hades. We get our idea of hell from Dante's Inferno and, and things that have been taught many, many years, hundreds of years over time, okay? Hell was created for Satan and his minions. It was never God's design that his people, his children, would go there. Now, he'll honor the request of those that reject him for them to go there, but hear me. Nowhere in Scripture, hear me. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that us, the kids, the humans, will go there and for an eternity scream and die and writhe and, and be burned and, and, and hurt and torment. Satan and his minions will. Scripture says that for the humans, for the kids that go there, that the smoke of their torment goes on forever. Now, it's been used as a manipulation tool. If you don't want to go to hell, you need to repeat this prayer after me and and, and all of this kind of stuff, and that's terrible. That's not, that's not, that may not be, it's not a get out of jail card free, okay? It's not, heaven's supposed to come into us, and eventually we're gonna end up there. That's kind of like the bonus. The good deal is for heaven to come into us now. So, your sweet Aunt Martha that never accepted Jesus as her savior is not gonna go burn in hell for all eternity. Because God is a compassionate God. Well, he is a just, and loving God, he is also a compassionate God. And Satan and his minions are going to rise and torment for all of eternity. But nowhere does it say that humans, that people will. So, back to commercials over. Um, when my identity was stolen from me, and I don't look like God wanted me to look anymore, he looks down and he doesn't see my original created value he sent Jesus to die on the cross, a horrible death, unrecognizable, because we had become unrecognizable to the Father. And he exchanged for us that ugly, unrecognizable, broken, hurt, sinfulness, and gave us our identity back. And now we can look to the Father 
when God looks at me, he doesn't see me, he sees Jesus in me. He doesn't see all of my past sin, all of my brokenness, all of my mistakes, all of my really bad choices. He doesn't see any of that. He sees the Son in me. Because He became sin who knew no sin so that I could become righteousness. That's a sweet deal on my end. That's like getting a million dollar lottery and you didn't even buy a ticket. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so he died on the cross to restore my value to me. Luke 15, 11, And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the share of the property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the youngest son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far-off country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pig slop. He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father said to him, his father saw him, and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best rope. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to celebrate. Hey. Hey, we're having church. Shut up. This is us, and it shouldn't be called the story of the part of the son. It should be called the love of the father. Because my value is what was paid for it. Okay, something's only worth what was given for it in monetary value. My life is valuable enough that the Son of God became Son of Man to take my sin away from me. Somebody's going to pay the price for my sin. It'll either be Jesus or me. I pick Jesus because I don't want to do it. And because it's a sweet deal. So this guy had two sons and one of them said, Dude, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. And he already had this plan because he took a journey. Now, many days later, he took a journey into a far country. Willful disobedience. He went where we went when we tried to do life on our own. He went away to a far country and he lost it all. Nobody ever says, I think I'll do drugs. It'll make my life better. Right? Nobody ever said, I think I'll enter into a marriage with a very abusive, addictive husband and see how it turns out. I bet it'll turn out good. <laughs> Nobody ever says things like that. Now, we think it's going to work out well because we're really delusional in our mind, but that's what this guy did. He said, give me all my money. I'm going to go over here. And he had all kinds of friends until his money ran out. And then his money ran out. He was destitute. So the only thing he knew to do was to do what I did when my life was at the bottom. Let's go back to the Father. He already did the little thought and the talk in his brain. This is what I'm going to say when I get there. You know, you prepared the speech ahead of time, and he'd done that. He prepared the speech ahead of time, ready to beg his father, please take me back. I know I can't be a son anymore. I'll be a servant. Just let me be a servant. But that's not what happened. The son got the robe, the ring, the shoes, the really good beef, and the party. Right? Because the love of the father never changed about the son, even though he went and acted like a fool. Because the love of the father never changes. The love 
that God has for me is not about how I'm behaving today. The love God has for me is about the condition of his heart. The reason I can love you and expect absolutely nothing in return, or I can love you and you can hate me, I don't care, because I don't expect anything from you. Because my love for you comes from him and I'm the conduit, and I don't need anything from you. Because he's already my everything. When we realize we're in a far off country and we have spent everything we have and it's time for life to be different, there's only one way for life to be different. And that's to understand and realize that there is a high price that's been paid for your identity to be given back to you. You may not even know you have an identity that's been stolen. For your identity to be given back to you and for you to live in Christ free whom the sun sets free is free indeed. It is not about religion. It is about a relationship. And it is about a life that I can't even put into words. And my greatest desire is that you would see that and want that. Nothing else happens. The junk in the trunk, the needs list, the food, more than any of that, my deepest desire and prayer is that you would want what I have, which is this, because this will set you free. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that, that the rain is somewhere else. The drops feel good. I thank you that your word is alive and active, and it changes lives. It brings back life to dead men. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make bad people good. He died on the cross to make dead people alive. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to die on the cross. That you said, I will give up everything for me, for us. Jesus, I thank you that the cross that you paid was excruciating, but the payoff is amazing. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you do life with us, that you are our helper and our comforter and our guide, and that you breathe life into us when we are born again, that we are made new through what Jesus paid for, which you designed, Father. Help us to see what our identity is and should be, and help us to want that. Thank you for the junk in the trunk. Thank you for all that you did for the needs list. I thank you for this amazing food today. I thank you for grace and mercy that's new every day. I thank you for your unconditional love. I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for freedom in Christ. I thank you for sobriety. And I thank you that there's new life in the new wineskin, and ain't nothing that Satan can take away from that. Thank you that he's a cut off withering branch. <laughs> Help us to see and understand what that means to our life. Holy Spirit, invade our lives this week. Show us who you are. We pray all, pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.